You're about to meet a young man dubbed the real-life castaway, rescued at sea after his mother disappeared in what seemed to be a freak boating accident. He says he expected sympathy, but what he got was a police investigation. ABC's Lindsay Janice asked some tough questions. It looked like an inspiring tale of survival. A young man missing for seven days, found drifting on a life raft. The son rescued off Martha's Vineyard. The Coast Guard had been combing hundreds of miles of ocean in vain, looking for Nathan Carmen and his mother Linda. And they'd just given up hope when the call came in. Nathan was alive. Found alive in good condition. But as he's pulled aboard the Chinese freighter that spotted him. When I saw the life raft, I did not see my mom. Uh, have you found her? Uh, no, we, uh, we haven't been able to find her yet. There's no sign of Nathan's mother, just his version of what happened. He arrives on shore under a cloud of suspicion. For some, his story just doesn't add up. I did not cause my mother's death. I love my mother. Present tense, I love my mother. Nathan decides he wants to tell his story, and he grants us an exclusive interview. He seems anxious, traumatized, worried he won't look or sound good on camera. There's a reason for this. Nathan has been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, which is on the autism spectrum. It's associated with social awkwardness and flat, measured speech patterns. Let's begin, if we could, with the fishing trip. As we talk, it's clear the conversation will be a fragmented account with plenty of blank spaces. I'm not going to go into that now. I'm not going to answer that. I'm not going to go there. But Nathan is able to provide more details about that ordeal at sea. Uh, my mom and I fished very frequently together. That's the primary thing that we did to spend time with one another. Nathan is from a wealthy New England family. His mother, Linda, a nurse who worked with autism patients, loved fishing with her son. He says that on September 17th of last year, just before midnight, he and his mom set out on that fateful trip aboard his 31-foot fishing boat named the Chicken Pox. I have experienced boating. I have uh, experienced fishing. I did not have experience offshore fishing. Even so, the two of them go 75 miles farther than usual to catch tuna to an area called Block Canyon. It takes them all night to get there. Nathan says the new day was perfect. They had life vests on board, but weren't wearing them. Hours passed. It was midday when he says the trouble started. I heard a noise and the belt on the engine uh, was picking up water and kind of spinning it. What did you think? I knew that there was a serious problem, but I didn't think we were sinking. I thought that I was going to diagnose the problem uh, and that we were going to go back to shore. He says he told his mother to gather the fishing lines in the rear, but he says to his shock, in no time, the boat was underwater. I was walking on the deck, it was there, and then it wasn't. Any sign of your mother at this point? No, not at that point. He claims he was totally disoriented. I got on board the life raft and was looking around, and I was calling out uh, to my mom. I did not see or hear my mom. But police aren't buying Nathan's story. Before he even stepped foot on land, they had executed this search warrant on his home in rural Vermont, looking for evidence of reckless endangerment. Captain Dave McCormick runs Irish Jig Charters out of Ram Point Marina in Rhode Island, where Nathan and Linda set sail from. How are you? Nice, nice to meet you. He is puzzled by Nathan's actions after he realized the boat was taking on water. There was a functioning alert system on board. Nathan never used it. How long does it take to activate it or make a mayday call? Oh, it's call? just a matter of seconds. Just flip the switch and it's activated. It's a manual type. I had a radio, and there was also an emergency position indicating radio beacon. I didn't know that we were sinking. I knew that we had a problem, but I didn't know that we were sinking until we sank. Investigators see a possible financial incentive for foul play. Is Nathan due to get all of his mother's money? I think it's around seven, eight million. Eight days after our first interview, Nathan invites us back to Vermont to set the record straight. Hi, Nathan. How are you? I was lost at sea. My mom died. Well, it would be great to have people embracing you. 
saying, we're glad you're home, we're glad you're alive, and also helping me to deal with my mom's death. It's, it hasn't been that. He says he was counting on support from Linda's three sisters, his aunts. Instead, there's been a stony silence. I haven't received any calls. Not from a single one of them. That's correct. It makes me feel like I have no family. Nathan's aunts didn't want to speak with us either. Their focus is not on relationships, it's on getting answers to questions. Nathan grew up about 100 miles south of here in Middletown, Connecticut, a suburb of Hartford. An only child, his parents divorced when he was very young. His mother, Linda, was everything to him. She was a good person, a warm person. We did have a challenging relationship at one point in my life, but she was the only family who I really had. Another source of comfort, Nathan's grandfather, Linda's dad, John Shockless, a multimillionaire real estate and nursing home developer. He was like a father to me, and I know I was like a son to him. But on December 20th, 2013, the 87 year old was found shot to death in his modest Connecticut home. One of his daughters had gone to check on him and found him in his bed with what looked to be gunshot wounds to his head and back. Cops focus on the last person to see Shockless alive, none other than his beloved grandson. The two had dinner together earlier that evening, but police say Nathan's whereabouts later that night are unaccounted for. He was definitely our prime suspect. And according to this 2014 search warrant, Nathan discarded both the hard drive of his computer and the GPS unit used on the morning of December 20th, 2013. That he'd recently bought a 308 caliber rifle, the same caliber weapon used in the homicide of John Shockless. Coincidentally, neither Nathan's rifle nor the murder weapon were ever found. Nathan categorically denies having anything to do with the murder. If they had asked me, Nathan, can we look at your hard drive? Or Nathan, can we have your GPS? At that time, when, I had, when they were in my apartment, my answer would have been, sure, gladly, you can take it. Uh, but they didn't. He says there is no link between his grandfather's death and his mother's disappearance. There's no relationship between my having uh, been the last person other than the killer to have seen my grandfather alive and my having been on the boat with my mother when it sank. When we ask Nathan again about what caused the boat to sink, he simply says he doesn't know. I'm not a diesel engine mechanic. But boat owner Mike Iozzi told police he saw Nathan on the dock just hours before his fishing trip. It kind of caught my eye when I saw him leaning over the back and drilling two holes in the transom of the boat. He says Nathan told him that he was removing stabilization devices like these, something called trim tabs. Nathan admits removing the trim tabs, but claims he patched the holes properly with marine putty. Another thing that's happened since we last got together, police searched your mom's home. Yeah, we're, we're, Did you know we're, anything about that? We're done for this evening period. We're done. We're here. not trying to make you uncomfortable. We're, we're, we're trying to give you an opportunity to answer some of these allegations. We're done here this evening. But 20 minutes later, Nathan sat back down to answer more questions. Most people would think I'm gonna die out here. And, and the way that I handled that was to focus on uh, what I had to do in order to survive. Six weeks after Nathan Carmen was rescued, Linda Carmen's body still hasn't been recovered. But Nathan organizes a memorial for her in downtown Hartford, Connecticut. Conspicuously absent from the service, Nathan's three aunts. I wish very much that my whole family could have come together uh, to pray for my mom. Right, I need to close my door. Okay. Tonight, Nathan remains the focus of an intense multi-agency investigation. For Nightline, I'm Lindsay Janice in Vernon, Vermont.